In Acts chapter 18, Paul was living and ministering in the city of Corinth. Looking back, Paul could recount many trials and tribulations, but the Lord had delivered him out of them all. This is what Paul would later write to his disciple and co-worker, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10-12, through 12, Paul writes, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul would also write to his disciples in Corinth, reminding them of how he had suffered the loss of all things for the sake of the gospel. He writes, But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. This is the true mark of an apostle. Paul was not promoting himself, but Christ. Only someone who truly knew that Jesus was the risen, triumphant Lord could be able and willing to suffer such personal loss and reproach for the sake of the gospel, like Paul had. Paul wrote to his disciples further in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, defending his apostleship. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys, often. In perils of waters in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. Paul admits that he is speaking here as a fool. In other words, he's not really bragging about being so spiritual based on how much he suffered for Christ. Rather, Paul is pointing out that he's not exalting or promoting himself like other false apostles who had criticized Paul. If Paul were a false apostle, like his enemies falsely claimed, then why would Paul be willing to suffer for the gospel to the extent that he had? Paul is not getting any personal glory or benefit out of having the title or position of apostle. Rather, he's pointing out that his greatest honor is to be identified with Christ, especially with Christ's reproach and sufferings. Remember that elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, Paul had written, And if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. True spirituality is not measured by what degree we are inconvenienced in serving Christ. A person may suffer the loss of all things in serving Christ, and yet become bitter or proud over their loss. In such a case, all their suffering and self-denial would do them no good if they became bitter, resentful, or proud. For the Christian, the purpose of suffering persecution or self-denial is not suffering or self-denial in themselves. There is no inherent spiritual value in such things. Rather, these things become a measure of our valuing of Christ far more than those things which we give up for Christ. 
For the Christian, the goal of self-denial is not self-denial itself, but love. Love for God and love for others. This is the real purpose and motive of Christ's own sufferings on our behalf. Our greatest honor as Christians, then, is to suffer loss for the sake of loving God and loving others, just as Christ does. Jesus himself said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Most people are willing to suffer inconvenience or loss for the things that they really believe in and are passionate about. What about Christ and his kingdom? How passionate are we for Christ's call? As in the other cities, Paul was now experiencing hostility and opposition from unbelievers in Corinth. He had faithfully preached the good news of Jesus to the Jews in the synagogue in Corinth. Sadly, the congregation had become split, with half believing the gospel and the other half blaspheming. Many of the unbelievers, no doubt, were blaming Paul for this congregational split, and they were labeling Paul as divisive and subversive. Remember that Jesus had warned that such things would happen. We can only imagine how weary Paul must have been after all the persecution and all the suffering that he had experienced in the previous cities. Perhaps now he was beginning to prepare himself for more of the same. How beautiful then that Jesus would personally appear to Paul in a vision and encourage him. Jesus told Paul, don't be afraid, but speak, and don't remain silent. Perhaps Paul was considering toning things down a bit so as to avoid further conflict or unpleasantries. But Jesus exhorted Paul to do the opposite. Be bold. Don't be afraid. Don't hold back. But speak out freely. Jesus encouraged Paul, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. How helpful for Paul to have this inside information. We recognize, through this example, the role of divine intervention in the life of the believer. God expects us as believers to trust and obey. There is much to be said for steadfast faithfulness. Sometimes seeking signs and miracles is unbelief, not belief. Jesus himself said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Yet Jesus also said, signs and wonders shall follow those who believe. This is really the test when it comes to signs and wonders. Are they following us or are we following them? Believers are called to follow Jesus, not signs and wonders. Yet Jesus promises that when we follow him, signs and wonders will follow us. We may not always see miracles when or how we want them, but God is always right on time in every situation. Jesus knows exactly when we need a miracle. At times, Jesus will supernaturally calm the seas. Other times, he simply says, let's cross to the other side. Sometimes the greater miracle is not stopping the storm, but passing through it with Jesus. In this case, Jesus knew that Paul needed a miracle, so he graciously appeared to Paul in a vision and gave Paul essential inside information. This no doubt encouraged and emboldened Paul. Through this supernatural vision, Paul could have confidence that he wouldn't have to face the same kind of persecution that he had faced in other cities, despite the hostility and opposition from the unbelievers in Corinth. Things would be different here. God's miracles are given not to further our own personal agendas, but to fulfill heaven's agenda. God has his own mission and purpose. When we submit our lives completely to his purposes, then we can be sure that miracles will surely follow. God's miracles are always right on time. God speaks to us when we need his specific direction. Until then, are we being faithful to what he's already said? Let's seek to walk by steadfast faith, serving Christ wholeheartedly. Like Paul, let's consider it a privilege to value Christ far more than any other thing. 